Hello, St. Joseph's. We are back and honored again to have Charles Milling with us. And so Rev. Mary has joined us today. Uh, Hi. We decided that because uh, Pope John the 23rd has some uh, humorous stories connected with his life as, as well as some saintly things for which we celebrate his life that we do sort of a part two in this week in which we celebrate his feast day in our Episcopal Church. So we're going to start with a tune by Charles and if you hang on I'll bring up the lyrics to God Was There. <laughs> going to bring up onto the screen some of the readings that are assigned for that feast day of John the 23rd and I'm going to start with the collect. Lord of all truth and peace you raised up your Bishop John to be servant of the servants of God and gave him wisdom to call for the work of renewing your church. Grant that following his example we may reach out to other Christians to clasp them with the love of your son and labor throughout the nations of the world to kindle a desire for justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. 
And I'm going to read the Old Testament reading appropriately assigned for this feast day of John the 23rd from Joel chapter 2, verses 26 to 29. <clears throat> you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I'm going to skip down to the gospel that it is assigned and invite Rev. Mary to read that, which is John 21, 15 to 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I love these readings that are assigned for John the 23rd, especially that one that I read from Joel, because it talks about your old men shall dream dreams. And in a very appropriate one for him, Angelo Roncalli, who became a pope when he was in his late 70s, which was a little bit unheard of in that time, uh, and the late 50s, 1950s. Uh, but one of the stories, and Mary's going to share some also about him, but when he was a young man, he was just a young parish priest uh, in uh, northern Italy. As I mentioned the other day, he was the third, I believe, of 11 children in his family. And uh, I ran across this little anecdotal thing that when he was that young priest, he gave a prophetic description of what it means to be a saint. And he said, we tend to make saints larger than life, more like figures in a movie or a novel than like your neighbors down the street. Saintliness actually results from learning the art of self-giving love. It flows from dying to self, from laughing at one's own foibles, and humbly enduring the foibles of others. Saints aren't so much superstars of holiness as humble sinners, ready to allow God to love them just as they are. And such a saint was John the Twenty-Third. I was sharing with Mary this idea, and she remembered a few stories about him, and I'm going to invite Mary to, to share some of those anecdotes with us, and then we'll go from there. Well, <clears throat> I'm much older than Marty, so I was in high school when he, was, uh, when he became Pope, and I remember the reaction of just about everybody was, oh, he's an old man. He's, he'll, he, he must be just a place setter. He's just taking care of the place until they can get a real Pope in there. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't agree with that. So the next thing was this announcement that he was going to call a council of the whole church, which was also confusing because the Pope before him, Pius XII, had been a Pope, had been the Pope for years and years. I don't remember anybody before him. So that's how long he was in there. And, um, Everybody said, a council of the whole church, how can you do that? What's going to happen? And so anyway, life went on, and nobody thought too much about it. And then when I was 17 years old, I entered a convent. That was in 1960, so you can figure out how old I am. And uh, it was very exciting. It was very exciting because for the first time, first of all, there was a big dust up because they didn't invite women to be part of the council. 
and they had to deal with that, which came as a surprise to the bishops, but they solved the problem by inviting women to be observers without a vote. And uh, it seems like today, how did they get away with that? But they did. And although I don't think women were happy, I mean, I was just young nun at the time, but there were some pretty big names in those women they invited to, to be uh, non-voting observers. Anyhow, so uh, the council started, and again, to everyone's surprise, including the bishops, because I remember at the time I read some articles and um, editorials by some of the bishops who were present, they thought they were going to start with a discussion of the church. What was the church? What was the history of the church? Who was who in the church? You know, the hierarchy and all of that. And instead of that, they found themselves looking first at the decree on the liturgy, which was really interesting, which didn't seem interesting to a lot of lay people, I think, until it started in and they said, well, you know, why are we still doing this in Latin? We should be doing this in the language that people can understand. They took as their um, um, guide, I guess, that people coming to liturgy should be um, involved, should be integrated into the liturgy so that it wasn't just people sitting in pews watching the priest, that they had to be actively involved. And I you know, there were four words, which I now can't remember, but um, it was that that was what the liturgy was. It was part of your life, and it was supposed to be integrated into your life. So right away, they started talking about uh, switching from Latin to the language of the people, whatever, where, around the world. So here it was English. And uh, they set up a commission to rewrite all the prayers in English, which they did. And it took a lot of years for them to do that. And then that was approved by all the American bishops, went to Rome. John the Twenty Third was gone by then. And Rome sent it back and said, oh, no, no, these are two. You have inclusive language here. It's not authentic. So we have to go back to uh, talking about he and him and his and uh, not only for us, but also for God. So that was the first kind of stumbling block. But then um, eventually, at least, I'm trying to think, I went home in uh, 1964 and they still in my home parish uh, had not made any switches and they were doing their best to ignore the fact that this council was going on. But Eventually, they really had to do that, at least with the liturgy. There were other things that weren't so successful, but at least with the liturgy. And, um, and suddenly, people got really excited and really interested in what was going on, because now it was affecting their lives. They were going to church on Sunday, and the priest was facing them and talking to them, and everything was in English so that they could pray with the priest, and it was a whole new experience of church. Some people didn't like it. But most people did. So anyway, getting back to John the 23rd. Oh. <clears throat> um, Mary, did, that we, did, is, did we lose you there? <laughs> you, you certainly did. I think it was the ghost of John Paul II saying, just a second, wrong quote. But um, we lost your video there. I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how to get back visually. Nope, I think we lost her. I think we lost her. Hang on. Go. Okay. Well, uh, we used to call always, I always heard people, no matter who they were, refer to John the 23rd as Good Pope John. Mm -hmm. So we had Good Pope John, and he was good. And he was also very, uh, matter of fact, down to earth, humble. Um, he. Um, he was uh, he was asked one time when he was first oh maybe a couple of months after he was became pope they said um, somebody asked him how many priests worked in the Vatican and his answer was about half <laughs> <laughs> so that was the kind of pope he was and um, uh, he was he was just an ordinary 
Ron Colley. You know, he was not the other guy before him. Uh, Pius the Twelfth was being carried around on a sedata, uh, a chair that people carried, and he was always in huge um, hats and all kinds of gold. Uh, John Paul, John Twenty uh, Third wasn't like that at all. So uh, he starts the council, and they start working. And um, one of the things that I really liked was that when it came to a um, a paper they wanted to write on the church in the modern world, uh, John the 23rd called Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky and asked Thomas Merton if he would write that. And that was a very, um, well, it was very appropriate, but it was also very controversial mm -hmm. because Merton, as you know, I think led a kind of a high life when he was a young man. And then when he was in the monastery, he was writing against the Vietnam War, which was going on at the time, and about civil rights and inviting all kinds of people down to his hermitage. It was the best visited hermitage in the world. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I've been always been grateful that Merton was called on to do that, and he did do it. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the council, they had, I wish I remembered more details about the council, but I just remember being so happy it was all going on, it was all exciting. We thought we were start going to have a new church, not a new church in the sense of not the original church, but the original church meeting the needs of today's world, of that day's world. Uh, John the 23rd talked about opening the windows. When I was in the novitiate, they didn't exactly open the windows, but um, but I remember them being excited about the liturgy and other things. And, and he also said that we had to um, read the time, signs of the times. And that was something the church had not been particularly good on in the 20th century. So that was a whole new thing as well. Mm -hmm. At the end of the council, they set up committees or commissions to implement what the council had written. And if you want to read the... Um, the papers of the council, they're really beautifully written. You know, you think, oh, papers from, from church council must be boring. They're not boring at all. And they're not all that difficult to read either. And I'd certainly recommend the one on the liturgy. It's quite beautiful. Anyway, um, so they set up these commissions and there was a, um, there was a lay couple, there were lay people on the commissions and nuns as well as bishops and priests. And there was a, a lay couple, and I cannot for the life of me remember their last name, but they were Pat and Patty. So it was very easy to remember their first name. They had been very active in what we used to call then Catholic action and were um, invited to be observers at the council and then were invited to be on one of these commissions. So in the commission they were on, the bishops the, on the agenda was the idea of eating meat on Friday, which sounds trivial today. It was pretty trivial then, actually, but my mother made us get up from hamburgers one time and walk out of a luncheonette because she remembered it was Friday. So it wasn't so trivial for the people who lived under this. Anyhow, so the bishops, so one bishop says, well, we don't even have to discuss this because after all, we cannot change this. Because think of all the people we consigned to hell for eating meat on Friday. And Patty, the wife, said to him, Your Excellency, what makes you think that God obeyed your commands? And that was the end of the discussion, all right. But that was dropped, that meat on Friday thing. Mm -hmm. So the next time you're having a hamburger on a Friday, you can thank Patty for that. <laughs> she, she was very good. She was really very good. But a lot of things were going on as a result of the council here. I remember when I <clears throat> left the convent in 1964, and I don't remember dates exactly now, but I remember that date. Um, <clears throat> but the parishes were so bad because most of them didn't pay any attention at all to the council. All the nuns, by the way, went off to school, to graduate school to study theology. It was the first time women were allowed in the schools of theology. Women couldn't study graduate theology until the Second Vatican Council. So now they could, and they went out in swarms. Every nun I knew was going out to the Midwest or someplace to study theology. However, 
they were sent out by their superiors to do this because the superiors didn't know what was going on. So they figured if all these nuns went out and found out, they could come back and teach everybody else, which they did. Uh, those who came back, a lot of them came back with husbands. And so that was the end of that cigar. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, more nuns went out for graduate school than priests because the nuns had no choice. They were sent out by their superior. The priests, however, did have a choice. They could go. They could go anytime anyway, if they wanted to. Most of them, and not, I shouldn't say most of them because I don't know most of them, but a number of them decided there was no point to it. And this was a passing thing. John 23rd was still an old man and he was gonna die soon. And then we'd go back to normal. Which thank God we didn't do, at least at that time. But um, it was, it, it started um, the, the uh, study of women in the Bible and in the scriptures. And some of the leading uh, women theologians of our time uh, were young then. Elizabeth um, Johnson, who's probably the preeminent Catholic theologian in the country and is a feminist theologian, was uh, a class ahead of me in high school and uh, then a class ahead of me in, in Brentwood. And who knew she was brilliant? She was. So, uh, so there's a lot of that kind of thing going on. But what I remember in my own uh, experience is that the parish Parishes was so bad and the liturgy was so bad and all of the things that we had been reading about. Uh, there was a newspaper that was started at the time, which is still around. In fact, I have a subscription to it. It was the National Catholic Reporter. And that was an independent newspaper run by lay people. So it was um, a whole different story from the local diocesan paper. So a group of us, I don't know how I even met these people. I think probably at... Um, demonstrations against the war or something but anyhow a group of us found ourselves together and wondering what to do and a young priest uh, in the Brooklyn Diocese where I was living uh, started uh, saying mass in people's homes on a Wednesday night and uh, I have to admit now and in, in hindsight it was wonderful we loved it and it was great and we absented ourselves on Sunday because we had gone on Wednesday which again was unheard of I mean that was a mortal sin not to show up in church on Sunday but um, a lot of experimentation, shall we say, was going on. And it was very heady, but of course it needed to, it needed to come back a little, a little bit. Instead of that, of course, John the 23rd died. And uh, the popes that followed him, Pope Paul, allowed the council to continue and to finish its work, which was a good thing. But he was also kind of a timid man and he was very hesitant to put into place what the council had decreed. Um, I think in retrospect, he did his best, but he just, he didn't have the personality or the courage of John the 23rd. And then the next uh, Pope after that was John Paul the first, and he died after a couple of months. So that was the end of, of him. And then came uh, the great John, the Pope John Paul II, uh, who was, in, after his death, hastily, I would say, uh, canonized. And he was very strong, came from behind the Iron Curtain, did not, brook. people outside the church thought he was great because politically he was strong, he was anti-communist, all of that. But within the church, he ruled with an iron fist. And he particularly was very suspicious of women and uh, any priest who, tried to hold, I would say, tried to hold on to the vision of the council, but he saw it as something else. And, um, and then he reigned for a long time and he rolled back all of the, uh, all of the uh, progress, I thought, that of the Second Vatican Council. And you know, Marty, I've often thought if the Second Vatican Council had been allowed to proceed as it was, I wonder if we'd still be sitting in different rooms praying to the same God. Mm -hmm. Because the Episcopal Church and the, and the Roman Catholic Church were so close. Mm -hmm. And yet, as Catholics, we were not allowed to put set foot in a, an Episcopal Church or any, any Protestant church or any, certainly not a synagogue. But uh, that whole thing about ecumenism, the people who were involved in it went on with it and are still, are still working on it. But 
it really took a backseat to everything else once once John Paul II came in because he was not he was only interested in the Eastern churches. Mm -hmm. He would like to have made some detente with the Orthodox Church. They weren't so interested, uh, but he never looked to the West to see if he could make uh, some kind of uh, thing. My friend Elizabeth Johnson is on that commission, the um, Catholic Anglican, Anglican Catholic tradition. So uh, we may find it sometime soon, but we've lost a lot of time on it, of course. Mm -hmm. But back but to think, huh? Back back to John the twenty third a little bit. I, I for, for for us who who at least tangentially were a part of it. You more than me. I was a, I was a young boy and. I do remember the Latin Mass. I do remember starting to be trained as an altar boy with the Latin and the prayers at the foot of the altar and all of that, uh, but was very much aware and have in my memory when things were changing, when the altar turned around. So those of you that don't know, it used to be the priest faced the wall, uh, expressing that, you know, uplifting of prayers to God, but forgetting that whole aspect of the the sacrament as opposed to the sacrifice of us sharing the meal together and the liturgy the work of the people and then the everything was turned around so that the priest as we experience it today in, in our churches uh <clears throat> the mainline catholic and episcopal churches anyway the 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 altar faces the people the priest faces the people and and all of that and i can remember we thought we were such rebels back when people yeah. like Ray Rep were coming out with these right. uh, simple guitar tunes. Uh, and, you know, um, here we are all together as we sing our yeah. song. <laughs> and sons of God, here is holy word. I mean, all of these things that in retrospect were three chords, C, F, and G. Uh, and, but it, it was such a difference. And paved the way for so much that, you know, we, we think now, I mean, half the church's favorite hymn is Here I Am, Lord, from the St. Louis Jesuits. Right. Well, all of that wouldn't have happened unless these changes would have happened back in the 60s. That's right. uh, and and this this wealth of On Eagle's Wings, Michael Johnson, Jonkis' mm -hmm. greatest hit, you know. Being all, out afraid. Yeah, all of those things that ended up coming out of this that were enabling people to to i mean can you imagine trying to sing that stuff in latin you know it's just <laughs> fathomable but that that's how much transpired back then and it was it was this this old man dream and dreams this this guy that was elected a pope and who would have thought and in, in his late 70s to call this council listening uh i know there's a lot of talk about him listening to nudges from god and that certainly was a nudge right. we're grateful that he listened to because it has such a positive impact on our world. And, and even in that collect that we pray, you know, how appropriate it is for right now. It talks about love. It talks about social justice, uh, which, which are all those things that we are just, just crying out for right now in our world. So thank God mm -hmm. for, for good Pope John. Good Pope John. And when he died, people were bereft. I remember that not just Catholic people, but everybody was so sad that good Pope John had passed to his eternal reward. Mm -hmm. And think of what, but you know, think about what he achieved in the short, relatively short time of his papacy. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody um, actually in the parish said to me one time, oh, I don't know, my, my children are grown, my husband died. I don't know why I'm still hanging around. Ha. Huh? Imagine if John the Twenty Third said something like that. I don't know. They want to make me the Pope, and I don't think so. I'm in my seventies. Why am I hanging around? You can't do that until the day you die. You don't know what God has in store for you. I mean, I try to think of that myself. <laughs> I don't know. Remember, remember when you were discerning your call, and uh, Bishop Friday had some wise, mm -hmm. wise words to say to you about god not having a limit to age when he calls us <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> bishop friday was really great yeah. i mean really you talk about beloved people i was he was beloved certainly to me but i know to many yeah um and still. good 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 man so we have uh we have a lot in common you know i think that's why so many 
of our people, and so many Episcopalians are former Roman Catholics, because in the essentials, there's really not much difference mm -hmm. in theology, in liturgy. It's just in these rules that were made in more modern times that, that hurt people, really. Mm -hmm. uh, rules made by men for whatever reason, but but certainly not scriptural. I mean, um, I forget which Pope it was. I think it was Paul, but I'm not sure, who had the commission on whether women could be ordained. And there were three different committees in this commission. One was bishops, one was theologians, and one was women. I'm uh, sorry, not women, but lay people. And all three of them came back. All three of them came back and said, there was no scriptural or theological reason why women could not be ordained. And he just brushed it aside and made that decree anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the more I talk about it, the more I think it was Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but yeah, but there were so, there were so many stories. I, you know, it's early in the morning for me, but <laughs> uh, they were just, they were just great. And we thought it was all great. And, we thought we were changing the church and the world because so much was going on in the world in those days. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was all put a stop to, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we had to wait a long time for it to be open again. And now I think that's why people love uh, Pope Francis because he has a similar kind of personality. He's, try he's not good on women, let me say, but I excuse him, well, I don't excuse him, but I think he feels because of his age, he doesn't have a lot of time. And he's trying very hard to reform the Curia. That's the crowd that John XXIII said, half of them work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they're very good at condemning other people. So I think that's where his locus lies. I think that's what he's focused on. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he's trying, he's trying, despite the fact that a lot of bishops are fighting him tooth and nail, especially the American bishops. Mm -hmm. But he has a lot in common with John the 23rd, I think. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, I was glad I was alive then. You know, it's something to becoming old is that you have some pretty good memories as well as the bad ones. <laughs> and uh, people in my time didn't experience World War II. Mm -hmm were children, small children, at uh, the Korean War, definitely got hit by Vietnam, uh, and the death, I would say, of John Kennedy. But uh, to live through something like the Second Vatican Council was a, was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. really was. I wish I could do it more justice than I am this morning, but it's just, well, I could do a small group. <laughs> it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think you've given everyone who wasn't um, around then or weren't yeah. part of the Roman church or aware of the Roman church. It, right. I think you've given a good sense of, of the issues that were being dealt with and mm -hmm. the wonderful way in which John the 23rd uh, tried to follow that dream. So uh, thank you for giving us that, that input. And certainly as we conclude, perhaps it's, it's something for us to think about as I started with his sermon as a young priest that um, anybody and all of us are called to be saints in whatever way, no matter mm -hmm. how young or how old. Mm -hmm. And we should never think that just because of our age, God can no longer use us because he is a living uh, example now in heaven, of course. Uh, that God can use us at any time God chooses in an incredible way. The story of my life, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there are, there's that day on the calendar reserved for you, Rev. Mary, when the time is right. <laughs> oh, God. Listen, they opened up Ireland today. And uh, next week it's complete, being completed, which is good because they had a lot of uh, a virus. Mm -hmm. And they seem to have gotten it under control. and. Um, I was supposed to be there today. That's why it's on my mind. We were going yeah. to Ireland to take our grandchildren to see where their grandfather was born and raised, but Super. next year. All right. Well, maybe in a future session, we can talk more about that part of your background as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's fine, Marty. Thank you. I'll have to figure out a